I'm, I'm horrible in relationships. You would think I'm great, right? But I mean, I suck in relationships like that. But um, <laughs> no, um, I come from that kind of world um, where everything was um, dog eat dog. Um, if you if you had money, if you had jewelry, and if you couldn't defend your stuff or protect it, you were getting took and you were going to get killed. And um, all my life, I've seen murders and robberies, and I became a part of that. And I. I took um, the choice to become a part of it because when you think about it, I have a brother who's like one of the top um, trauma surgeons in the country. I had a sister that was a teacher before she passed. And so I come from a very um, educated background. I never passed the ninth grade because I was just so entrenched into the street world. I was just really allured to that. That was really what I wanted to be because you saw instant gratification as far as respect was concerned in the street world. And I, I didn't have much patience and that's what I wanted. So. Um, I started getting involved with crime at a young age. My first arrest, I guess I was, what, 10 years old, my first arrest, um, pickpocket, Jocelyn. And so I went to, when I went to the institution, um, I, I realized I'm in this form. All oh, my friends are here. Everybody that saw me in the streets, pickpocketing other guys from different um, boroughs, and um, I got addicted to it even more. So I wasn't afraid to go to jail anymore. And so I became a, a more advanced criminal, so to speak. Um, I remember one day we were in the house, we were robbing somebody's house, and um, I was talking, about, I thought I was talking to my friend, somebody was whispering, I thought I was talking to my friend, and it was someone else in the house, and I thought I was talking to my friend. So as I told him, I heard somebody, we both were leaving the house, and my friend who thinks he's a professional, he tried to lock the door, but the guy came, opened the door, and blew his brains out right there. Oof. Yeah, and um, I ran. I was um, I was 12. He must have been 14. I ran. I just because that's what you do. You try to get away, and I ran. And um, and you would think that God, that would just send somebody straight. That same that um, me and my other friends we hooked up a little bit later. Let's get another house. And that's just what it was. It was this is how we lived our life. Um, most of my friends are pretty much dead. Or else they got so much time. I'm going to visit some guys tomorrow. And they got, um, they got caught under this Rockefeller law. They got 240 years. One more of my friends got five life sentences. He's only 50. And so um, these, are, these are the people that I go and see um, once a month, sometimes twice a month, because these are, these are my friends. These are who we grew up. This is, these are the guys I stayed over their house when, they, when my mother was doing what she was doing. This is just, these are my family, and that's what I do. I go see all my friends. And... Um, They'd be so um, intrigued to know I'm at this particular type of event talking about the situation when we were talking about, um, I was hearing them talking about these hard laws and helping people when they get out. Um, you know, it's gotta be a real neat trick to do that because those laws was um, the guidelines to put them in there for a long time because the people don't want them to ever come out and still get the $60,000 from them, or us, so to speak. So um, yeah, I'm one of those guys. So I went away in this other prison, um, institution and um, it's called Tryon, so I'm in Tryon, and I'm kind of like a badass guy, so somebody said something, or he pulled at my hat, so I stabbed some guy, and I went to another co correction. Then I went there, I, I got introduced to a German by the name of Bobby Stewart, and he started teaching me how to box, because I thought I was a tough guy. I didn't know anything about being a tough guy, but I thought I was. And so I went there, and um, it was so ironic, he didn't want me to go, because I kept, I kept improving, I broke his nose, and he was a professional fighter, and I'm 12 years old. And um, so I, um, I had this miraculous, um, this was just um, such an opportunity. I met a gentleman by the name of Custom Model, old Italian man. And um, when I went there, he, he talked to me. He talked to me for two weeks. He was talking, I thought he was, um, I thought he was a pervert because he was saying all these things that I'm beautiful and I can do this. And but when I sparred, I was getting shellacked. So I know I knew there was no way that he would think that I was a good fighter, but he saw something that I still don't see what he saw. To this day, I don't know how it worked. And he said if that I was going to be champ, I was going to do all this stuff. And that's what made me think this is a perv. Because where I come from, everybody's trying to, you know, it's a perv. I live in perv city. You know, everybody's trying to do this. No, this is real talk, though. I'm talking to you, man, you know. Um, so um, I started listening to this Italian guy, and he teaches me to fight. And I'm 14 years old. I win this, I win this national championship, then I won this junior national champion. I'm breaking records, I knock a guy out in eight seconds. How did that happen? And he still told me I was, I was imperfect, I was wrong, I was flawed. So um, 
I didn't know how that worked, and I just started listening. I said, um, when I went back home, I was getting ready to do some more robberies, because every now and then I would go back to Brooklyn and do robberies and come back, because the state was paying them like 150 bucks a month, and that, that wasn't even paying for my pants and my sneakers. So I always went back home and did robberies and came back with nice clothes and told them that my friends gave me these clothes because their older brother can't fit them anymore, something like that, some, some ridiculous story. And... Um, one day when we were going to um, do another robbery, a friend of mine was telling me, no, you're with those white people, Mike. Stay with them. These people love you, Mike. I saw you win this champion. They love you. So, um, so my friend had told me that me and him was together one day. We went by a dice game, and we, and we know these guys. These are our friends, guys we grew up with. But something was different. I saw them when we looked at the dice game. We didn't gamble. They looked at each other, and no one said hi. I said, what's up? They always said hi to me, but they didn't talk to him. And um, so we left, and like, um, a week later, they told me that um, they killed him. And so they, and my friend saw me and said, Mike, man, you walked off the game with him. I thought that you were killed too. Because I didn't know these guys were having this little um, secret war because I was just coming back and forth. I didn't know the information. And so um, ever since my friend died, I stayed up there. I never came back, and I became successful. And um, I became champion at, at 20 years old, the youngest champion ever. Um, I won titles. I won titles, I had, I had everything in the world, but I still had that darkness in me. I had hundreds of millions, I had money, but I still had that darkness in me. That darkness wasn't out of me yet. And I got in a whole bunch of trouble. I got involved with people who had made me no good. And um, I lost a lot of money. I kept getting lawsuits. I had lawsuits this, lawsuit here, lawsuit here. And most of my money I tricked off on lawsuits. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? I, you could listen. If I spend $250 million on girls and trips and clothes, that's nothing to what I did on lawsuits, okay? So they really got me good with those lawsuits. And, but um, it still, I still didn't have peace. I, something was, I still had that old darkness from back before. And then, um, because, you know, of course, my father and mother, they're addicts, um, and I'm not fighting anymore and I have nothing to do, why not I become an addict? Because that's just how it goes, right? So I become this addict now, because I always drank my whole life, never stopped drinking. And I became this addict, I've been getting in a lot of trouble. What happened, I had some kids from being an addict, I had to marry some people from during my addict stage. And, uh, <laughs> no, excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to like, um, So listen, um, and so I started going through this process of I'm cutting clean. So I get clean for a year. I get clean for five years, but then I relapse. And the reason why I relapsed is because I didn't have um I didn't have a spiritual awakening. Amen. I just wasn't using drugs. You know, I wasn't sober. I just wasn't using drugs and liquor. I just wasn't using I was miserable. Right? Um so eventually I, I, I received that spiritual awakening. And this is um this is listen, trust me. This is um Listen, when I'm at the height of my career, you know, I don't want to make this long, but listen, at the height of my career, I got, what, 40 men in the fight, I'm doing this, I'm going, I got boats, I got plans, I got everything. But they wouldn't touch me, a cartoon wouldn't touch me with a million foot pole. Now I got the number one cartoon on television. I got um, an Emmy, I got a Golden Globe. This is ridiculous stuff, I don't believe this is true. But uh, yeah, I got, um, I'm not perfect yet, but I'm just trying to get this stuff on track. And um, I'm taking, you know, I'm sober. By being sober, I'm able to um, show up for my children. Um, I'm able, they're able to go to the best schools in the country. I got a daughter that graduated from first George, what is it, George Washington, that's in DC. Then she went to Georgetown. Now she's in Drexel, that's Philadelphia somewhere, right? <laughs> well, she, she's in Drexel now. I got a daughter. My, yeah, my, 18, my 19 year old is in NYU, she's a um, director. And stuff. I have this other young kid. He's trying to go to um. Where's he trying to go? This guy. He's a character. He's, I have an 18-year-old son that me and him. You know, we we we, we crash. We 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 just don't get it. Something's wrong there. I don't understand that yet. Um, I, I'm gonna need some advice from some older people. But something's just not happening here. Um, and um, I'm just very um, grateful that my kids are able to go to these schools. And sometimes they tease me because I don't spell as well as they spell. And um, I'm not advanced scholastically as well as they are, but um, I'm just happy that I'm able to put them in that position, you know. And I just wish. Uh, and they give me a hard time because they think I'm, they think because I do this, they think I'm do that, they think I'm, 
I'm a show off, but the fact is, if they had my parents, then they would really have something to talk about. <laughs> I wish he had my father, because my children, believe it or not, I have a 27, they've never, they've never received a beating before. I've received beatings just by look. Somebody, I can remember being in um, Royal Farms. See, they don't have Royal Farms. You guys remember Royal Farms, right? Real cheap, um, just had being beaten in the corner because my mother couldn't afford something. And um, I'm just really um, grateful to be here talking to you. And even though I got sucker punched being the keynote speaker at this time, <laughs> I have a really, um, I'm really grateful for my life now. I'm really grateful. I'm really, um, Just by, um, just by the grace of Allah, I just was able to just do this because I chose I was going to be different. I wasn't going to live that life anymore, and I was going to be um, the person I wanted to be. And everything I was doing in my past life, you know, I was champ, I had money. That prevented me from being the man that I wanted to be. And um, I, could, I could pretty much say I'm on, a, I'm, on a, I'm, on a, I'm on a course of being the person I want to be. Um, I have dignity, I have self-respect, and anybody can just look at me and see what I'm doing. Thank you. Talk about being behind bars and what that was like, and then what, and then what? I'm not finished, I see. I don't believe I'm finished. I don't believe I'm finished. So, so, so Mike, can you just talk about your experience behind the bars, and then second, what has been the greatest source of transformation in your life to, um, for you to live a more godly life? So the first, if you could just talk about bars first. Well, listen, um, You have to understand, me being behind prison is going to be a lot different than the average person being behind prison. It was not pretty, you know, you're seeing, you know, everything I'm talking is true, you know. It's not, um, you don't see, um, like, guys walking around, everybody getting stabbed and raped because you're locked down. You don't touch nobody else. You're locked down. Everybody, it's very few people to trust you that, that are out. But normally you're locked down 23 hours a day, you're in that cell. And then when you go to the hole and they lock you in the hole, well, me at least, when they lock me in the hole, <laughs> you know, you're supposed to get your one hour of recreation. So I'm thinking I'm going to go to the yard. So they just put a, gate, a, a cage to my cell and they put a cage. Then you come out in the cell, the cage is this big, so you just walk for an hour like this. And that's your recreation. And for me, you know, some, some jails have... Um, I guess high security rates. Um, it's just not nice. People go insane. People go to hospital. People die in prison. You know, you never know who you're going to make it home. You may have an out there, but you just never know you're going to make it home. It's so de debilitating, and nobody gets. Um, what is the word they say when you go to jail and you get? No, there's no such thing as rehabilitation. You get prison is all debilitating. There's nothing rehabilitating about that. You know, because when you go in there, you never come out the same person again. You know, um, they give you these um, football numbers. They give you these massive times. I think if anybody do anything over 10 or 15 years, they shouldn't allow them to come back out because then you got a real problem coming back out. You know, I, listen, I'm just very grateful. I'm very grateful I had a, had a good life, and um, people liked me, and people gave me benefits and stuff, but that's not going to happen to the average guy. That's not going to happen. You know what's going to happen to him when he gets angry and he throws a tantrum like I throw my tantrum? They're going to come in the cell and they're going to beat him to death. You know, the goon squad's coming they're going to beat him to death. That's what's going to happen. They're going to put you in the hole. They're going to put the holes on you. They're going to beat you to death. And we're living in 2015. And all this, what I, and this, is, this, is, um, this is something uh, um, a nation of savages would look at as something that's a disgrace. And this is what we're doing in 2015. So listen, um, you have to understand, um, if you can't prepare them from going in there, because once they went through in there, I was hearing a gentleman talk about, but once you, about you know, preventing them, once you're in there, they're going to put the, the whammy on you. Once you're in there, everything's going to change. You have to prevent from going there. Once you're in there, it's almost a wrap. You know, some guys may become more articulated, more diadectic to read the books and have, you know, and they're very articulate with their words, but they have their demons in there working. They have their demons, and it's really hard to um, release those demons once you're in that place. Mike, can you just talk about how you've changed your life? And, and for many of us in recovery, like my friend Gloria said, it's also the spiritual element, because this isn't about changing your mind, it's about changing your heart. And so, whether it's your love of your children, your faith, what is it that's brought about that change for you to live a more godly, holy life? 
I don't know, I'm capable of living a godly life. God, God to me is inconceivable to live a life of God. You know, we can only study his life and hope to be able to be in the path of God. But to live godly life is inconceivable to me. To me, to me, you know, to me. Um, I just try to do the right thing, you know what I mean? And not necessarily the right thing is probably the best thing, but I just try to do the right thing. I try to um, respect everybody and treat everybody the way I want to be treated. You know, I don't have no, um, I don't care if what you're black, white, Christian, well, I don't care what you are. You know, the only thing I want is respect, because I give respect. That's the only reason why I want it. And um, I just realized that um, I wanted to change my life. I didn't like the way I was living my life. I wanted a different, um, I just wanted a, um, better, a better way of life. You know, I just didn't want to be the guy that had it all outside and had nothing inside. And I, found, I realized all this um, recovery and sober thing and life in general is an inside job. You know, um, if, you're looking, if, I'm, if you're looking for happiness from out here, it's going to be disastrous. It's going to be, from my perspective, maybe other people can get in. And I'm, and I'm different. I'm a little screwed up because I know something's wrong up there. I, 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 have, I have a real difficult situation receiving love and happiness from the outside and stuff. But um, it's, it's all an inside job. You know, it's all inside job, you know. All we know about God is what people tell us about God, what our mothers, our fathers, what they tell us about God. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't there when Moses split the Red Sea. I wasn't there when he got the commandments, you know. When you look at, if you, if you look at the internet, which we all look at, Moses didn't exist. There's no artifacts about it. But I hope that story is true. We you know? go to the promised land. And, and just, I know we got our dear friend Mario here. Mario, could you stand up? This is, and, and champ, what is your favorite restaurant in Jersey City? My favorite restaurant? Say the white man. Um, I don't know if it's the white manor. You know, I, I only eat at cause I, cause I eat at Ringside. The white manor. You know, I don't eat there. They got they got they have the what do what do what do they call those hamburgers again? The sliders. I don't want to eat sliders. You know, some pork in there probably. I don't want the sliders. I don't want the sliders. I don't want the sliders. I like Ringside. Tell, tell them what you do with the kids at Ringside. What I do is, oh, we have a gym there, and we work out the chips. You know, everybody has the program down there, and that's where we hang out with the kids. We work there, and of course, it's after school, Mario. The kids have to go to school, but for, um, <laughs> we have that, and we have most of the kids. They work there as well, so they also they get prepared the, for for the workplace, and they're gonna have jobs, and this is pretty awesome, and um, it's really it's really. Um, it's really sad that we live in the richest and most powerful country in the world and we have people starving out here, you know? And they have no other choice but to commit crimes or else they're gonna starve to death or have no dignity and their wife might leave them out of shame or the kids might not have respect for them. And um, I don't know, we can have a gang of these um, symposiums right here, but you know, we need some action and work has to be done. In, Oh, all right, say something, Mayor. Go ahead, say something. Say something, Governor. Okay. Yeah, but this is just what it is. We need some. We need work to be done. We're, we're, we're magnificent. No one talks better than us. No one is more loquacious than we are. No one speaks better than we are. You know, because you now listen, because I used to date somebody that was in um, what's that um, Koresh guy? Remember he had uh, what's that? A compound. You know the compound when the, the I used to date a girl that was in a compound, and I said. I said, did y'all guys um, recruit blacks? Did y'all have any blacks in the compound? And she said, oh, well, yes, we had blacks. They're the ones that give the best recruiting. So I said, there's nobody can talk better than us, right? But we need some action. We just need to get some action. And um, Jersey, Jersey City is a beautiful state. And this could be a beautiful country if we, um, we, we stop being elites and think we're better than other people and treat everybody like brothers and sisters. And this would be a wonderful place. But um, that's going to be a, a neat trick, you know? with the kind of people that we have running our country. Mm -mm. Would you like to say something, Mr. Governor? Amen, oh, that's oh. good. Can we give a round of applause for the champ? Thank, thank you very much. I've always liked Jersey City. Jersey's pretty cool. If this is not Newark, though, it's Jersey City. Jersey City. Uh, Jersey, City Jersey, Jersey City, Jersey City. Jersey City, baby, Jersey City. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much.